Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this first session of the online conference. Our, our session is related to the topic, the question of how can we better manage water for food and public health in a changing world. Uh, my name is uh, Raya Marina Stefan. I am a board member of IWRA, and I'm also the deputy editor in chief of its journal Water International. And I have the pleasure to moderate this session this afternoon with my colleague Asma Bakish. She will introduce herself later on. So without further not without uh, losing more time, I would like to uh, just introduce Josiane and Kema, who has accepted to give us a keynote speech in this uh, first session. So Dr. Nehema holds a PhD in chemical engineering applied to environmental protection. She currently leads at the International Water Resources Management Institute, the research group on circular economy and water pollution. And the group addresses also the global mission of promoting sustainable and inclusive growth under changing natural resources. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today on this subject, how we think at the International Water Management Institute, we can better manage the water for food and public health in a changing world. Changing because there are a number of challenges that we now have to address. There is urbanization, there is climate change. We had COVID also recently. So a number of disruptions that we need to, to work around and water is playing a key role in all, all of these elements. And this is what I will try and touch on. Yeah, so um, the International Water Management Institute is a research for organization, a research for development organization. So our vision is a water secure world. So really work on all elements that uh, concern and relate to water security. And we work to provide solutions for uh, sustainable and also climate resilient development. Uh, our research really is to develop the science that is going to bring and lead to transformation on the ground, especially when we look at the developing countries where our focus activities are taking place. Uh, on this map, you see in blue uh, the countries and the regions where we are working in. Uh, we have currently 12 regional or national offices around the world. Our headquarters are in Colombo. So as you can see, most of our activities are taking place in Africa and in Asia. So um, the research that we are doing, uh, the work we are doing really is responding to a number of, uh, of issues. There are some cross-cutting teams that we, we work on, like digital innovation that we make sure to introduce and to integrate into all research uh, strategic programs that we are implementing. But there are three main uh, programs around which uh, the, the water research that we are doing uh, is, is framed. So we have one on water and food, uh, water, food and ecosystems, where we work on all that concerns food security, uh, conservation of ecosystems and water. Um, we look at water and climate change and resilience. So what are the interactions, how to adapt and mitigate climate change, how to build resilience and, and, and address some of these issues that I mentioned earlier uh, that affect the society. And then the last one, which is of interest to me particularly, is the one on water growth and inclusion, where we work on how we can promote sustainable growth, how we can address gender issues. And then where I am interested, uh, we have a research group there, which I am leading and focusing specifically on how we can cut pollution and optimize the reuse uh, through circular economy, especially in the case of water, but also other resources. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the circular economy approach, let me introduce it to you very quickly, because I think the circular economy approach is really one way uh, we can better manage water for food and public health. In the linear approach that is commonly adopted, we, we use a, a very uh, simple 
method. So we extract the resources, we transform, we make use of it. And when we are done using it, we dispose of it. And then we have to go again and re-extract. So this is not, and we have noted that it's not the optimal way of making uh, use of the resources. So what we are working on and what we are promoting now is more the circular approach, where uh, there are three main guiding principles. We look at how we can preserve and enhance the natural capital, how we can optimize the productivity, how we can foster effectiveness. And all of this is playing a very critical role, helping us manage the water, uh, contributing to better food security. And also in many ways, when it comes to especially wastewater management, it really has a very great impact on public health. Okay, so there are reasons for which uh, many countries and many people are more and more engaging uh, into circular economy and adopting this approach in many, many sectors. And some of these benefits, I have listed them there. Uh, first of all, it helps in terms of competition. Uh, it increases the availability of resources, so it reduces the competition for water, for instance, in some areas. So allows resource diversification, improving water security, reducing carbon footprint. So all of these are benefits that are attracting many actors to, to this approach. Uh, economic impacts are also there. Uh, so there I can mention uh, the opportunity to create revenues. Uh, either direct revenues, but even revenues from the sales of a number of products. Uh, opportunity also to prevent public disease. So we know about COVID, we know also about uh, other pathogens and contaminants that are present in wastewater, which can be uh, addressed in many ways through the circular economy approach. And then the last one is how we can improve sanitation, um, how we can create job opportunities and also create products and be uh, marketed and generating in this way a number of wide benefits. Yeah, so uh, please press again, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the work that we are doing at the International Water Management Institute is looking at different aspects. So first of all, we have a very strong program where we look at how we can develop sustainable solutions to waste management. And when I say waste here, I involve both liquid and solid waste management. So there we look at policy measures uh, and we look at treatment options so on the two extremes. And then in between, we look at social responsibility driven measures and also financially driven measures because uh, they have to complement each other in many in many systems and then we work also on technologies and processes so how uh, we can use those systems you know to address the issues that we observe on the ground and then lastly uh, one thing we have worked very strongly on has been to develop business models for waste management um, so again there how we can make productive use of, of these waste materials and and address the number of issues and especially in the case of water, address water scarcity in some way. And you have on the right hand side some of the, the, the outputs that we have produced within the organization. They are all available for free uh, on our website. So you can go there and download those resources, which are certainly useful in many contexts. Um, yeah, so I want to give you a number of examples. So I've selected three examples that I want to share with you. Um, the first example is this one. So this is the case where you see globally that water is being reused in many urban and peri-urban areas. And this is playing a very critical role for food security. So globally, the organisms have high volumes of wastewater that are released with little to no treatment, very minimal treatment that is being achieved in many places. So when we look at the numbers, uh, we have 65% um, <clears throat> of this uh, water that is coming from, uh, you know, that is located in areas uh, where over a billion people are living. So it means that the food security of this large number of people is affected and impacted largely by uh, the kind of, um, um, yeah, the, the wastewater flows that, that are experienced in those locations. And then if you go into more details, we realize that a vast majority of these urban areas actually are located in developing countries where the treatment levels for the wastewater is very limited. So we end up with uh, wastewater diluted at different levels being reused. And this becomes extremely essential to ensure that you meet water security in those regions. So the challenge that we have now is on the safety aspect. So how can we make sure that that water is being used in a very safe manner? And in this way, we safeguard the public health in many aspects. 
Yeah, so the next slide actually gives you some of the solutions that we came up with and working with uh, the World Health Organization, among others. So the, on the top one, you see uh, the multiple barrier approach has been developed a couple of years ago. And this multiple barrier approach actually is looking at ways uh, to address, to mitigate the risk at different levels. So in case there is no wastewater treatment system that is functional, what other solution is available to address the problem? So you can implement solutions on farm uh, by the farmers so to adopt. It can move on to, uh, to the markets where these products are being sold. And then down the line to the consumer who's going to consume this within the household, uh, some measures can be put in place in a multiple barrier approach manner, and this is going to mitigate the risk along the line. Even though at first you start with wastewater that is being used for food production, in the end, by putting in place those safety measures, you end up with um, a product that is safe for the consumer that is consuming it in his household. And then to support the implementation and the adoption of this uh, multiple barrier approach, uh, we have really we have worked still with the World Health Organization recently to produce what we call the sanitation safety plannings. And those sanitation safety plannings are supposed to be like guidelines helping the different public uh, policy actors, public sector actors to take up uh, and implement the multiple barrier approach in many, in many setups. Um, the challenge that we have now with this, because we know it is already happening and it is very important for food security, but it could have also important health impact if it is not managed properly. So what kind of incentives can we provide farmers to make sure that they go on to implement those uh, multiple barrier approach, these multiple barrier approach strategies? Because the largest, I'll say, the biggest burden will be on them really to implement the right measures right from the start at the time the produce is being uh, obtained. The second example I'm giving you is this one, which is happening in India. So this is a typical work that we, we did in India. Uh, it's in two cities, Solapur and Vijawada, where uh, we are trying to see how we can integrate water reuse to address a number of issues. So in those cities, there are already wastewater treatment plants that exist. Those wastewater treatment plants are addressing water issues to some extent. They have secondary treatment systems that are in place. However, because of some industrial inflows and a number of other issues, uh, the, the, the quality of the water is not um, is not sufficient to enable reuse. So what we, uh, we proposed in this particular case was to see how uh, it could be, uh, we could int introduce tertiary treatment and using this tertiary treatment to uh, enhance the water quality. Uh, one thing that is very interesting in this model is that for this to be successful, if you want to have treated, quality treated water available for agricultural use, then we need uh, the model to be somehow subsidized by the industrial sector. So the industries will be paying a premium price, which will allow the treatment plant to be sustainable. And in this way, then uh, allow some excess water to be used for agriculture. So this is an example of situation where agriculture can benefit from synergies with other sectors, especially the industrial sector. This is the last example I have for you. This example of a study that is happening in Ghana where treated wastewater, here we are talking about domestic, not municipal, domestic treated wastewater is being used for brood stock production. Product, the, the fish is African catfish, uh, which is quite uh, from the experience that has been, the work that has been done before, is able to grow uh, under these conditions. But to mitigate the risk in this particular case, we decided not to grow food, uh, fish for direct consumption, but rather food stock, which will be used to generate fingerlings. So the fingerlings can then be read on clean water and what people are going to consume is really uh, what is going to come from the clean water. So this is one way of mitigating the risk and making sure that we end up with a system that is financially um, financially viable. So in terms of operation costs, maintenance costs, we have some opportunities to, to recover them there. Uh, and this kind of model is not really limited to Ghana. You have similar models that have been implemented in many other countries. In Bangladesh, for instance, you have models <clears throat> where you have uh, uh, fish feed that is produced along with, uh, you know, duck wheat, proteins, uh, other fruits, and so on. So a lot of opportunities there that we can we can explore. Um, my last slide to conclude today. Um, 
one thing that we see, I, I told you at the beginning of this presentation, that I really think circular economy from water is one way, uh, one important way really to address issues uh, and create better synergies between water and food and public health. But the reality of this is that uh, all over the world, the models that have adopted and applied the circular economy principles are still very limited. We don't have so many cases that exist so far for different reasons. There are a number of challenges, some of them that I have listed there, uh, issues with cost recovery, issues with policy that sometimes are not in favor of some of the initiatives, uh, issues with social behavior, processes, technologies. Some usually say there is no issue with technology. Uh, yes, there is no issue with technologies in some cases, but when you go to the developing world, then we need also technologies that are adapted to the local context, technologies that are not too expensive to operate, because when you talk about expensive uh, in the northern sector, it's not the same as expensive in the south. So we need to design technologies that are really adapted to the context to enable uh, those circular economic business models to remain financially viable. Look at how we can uh, Bridge. Uh, we can create links between agriculture and other sector. Uh, it can be um, energy sector. It can be, uh, you know, industry. Many other sectors we can explore to make sure that we have those synergies in place. So there is a bit of noise around me. Um, so some of the issues that we still need to address in certain investment climate is one of them. Uh, how we can address the climate? Yeah, the investment climate work on gender diversity issues, uh, linking up with all the other sectors that I have mentioned earlier. And then finally, address the safety concerns, which keep, they keep on changing. So a number of years ago, there was some focus. We had uh, a number of pollutants that were of concern. More and more are now being discovered. So continuously, we need to get prepared and we need to adapt to those new realities. Thank you very much. Let me close here for my presentation. Yes, thank you, Josiane, for your presentation. Thank you for keeping the time. Uh, your presentation is very informative about the advantages of adopting circular economy for managing water for food and public health. Um, there are two questions in the chat box. Uh, one of them, I will leave it to Josiane if she wants to answer it uh, by writing because it concerns the administrative organization of IWMI. But the second one uh, relates to, uh, to your presentation. And the question is, how does, is, does IWMI closely work with the local government in institutionalizing these efforts of circular economy? Yes, definitely. We, we work with a number of, of uh, actors. We work with the private sector, the public sector, we work with universities, civil society organizations, so really a wide number of, of, of actors. So if I give you one example, the example that we have in Ghana, uh, this is a public-private partnership that we have facilitated. So there is a private entity that is now managing the facility in collaboration with um, the public entity. So uh, an agreement... So there is an agreement that has been signed between the two parties, and that allows you know the different responsibilities to be shared in between. And then the role of in, in the process is really to provide the support that they need, uh, the scientific knowledge uh, that they require to make the model work. So yes, definitely we work with a number of actors, all those that are relevant to the model. Okay, there is another question. Uh, as the urban wastewater is already released initially in the environment, despite it is untreated as a baseline and available for users downstream, do we have methodologies to assess what is, the, what is exactly the amount of water that is available without impacting downstream users? Well, I mean, this, this is a very interesting. So in, in my presentation, there is one paper that has been published. It's actually a very recent publication which shows, um, it's, a, it's a map that shows um, uh, how important is the water, wastewater inflow for a number of countries. Uh, it's a global assessment actually that was done. So it shows uh, which cities and countries are more affected by, by those wastewater uh, inflows. So at the moment, of course, it's most most countries uh, are affected by that. So my numbers that I presented in my presentation talked about 65% globally. So 65% globally of the, the, the cropping system, uh, the irrigation system that is happening in the pale urban and urban areas 
is in located in catchment that is highly dependent on wastewater. Uh, so we know that without the wastewater inflow, there wouldn't be enough water for the production that is happening. And if there is not enough water, then of course those urban areas that directly depend on these cropping systems for uh, for food will definitely be affected. So there are major, there would be major issues with um, food supply, uh, food security in those urban areas without the inflow uh, of wastewater that, uh, that is known to happen. Okay, thank you, Josiane. So far, I don't see another question. Uh, will you stay with us uh, the whole session? Okay, so if, um, my, my, perhaps we will have uh, other question at the end because we have a Q&A session at the end of the session. So now, as, as there are no more questions, uh, we will move to the first presentation in this uh, session. So the first presentation is by, so uh, Professor Strzelnik is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, he will talk to us about climate change implications for food security in the Middle East, North Africa, and West Asia. And after his presentation, my colleague Asma will, will take uh, the, the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to thank everyone and good evening and good afternoon and good morning around the world to who are there. Um, one thing I want to say is this is going to make it a Texas A&M session. Um, many years ago, I was a faculty member there in civil engineering in, in College Station. So it's nice to be joining with some of my colleagues. Um, the work today is reporting on work that has been done at the um, Abdul Latif Jamil food, Water and Food Security Lab at MIT, which is funded by Community Jamil. And one of Community Jamil's uh, current uh, interest and focus is on climate change and public health. And particularly our project was to look at the issues related to nutrition uh, and how uh, climate change will affect that part. They're looking at other direct impacts of heat and other aspects, but this one is related to that. And as it's an ongoing study and in the first part of it was to look at the GCC in West Asia, which we're looking at right here. And for those who aren't aware, the GCC is the Gulf Cooperative Council, and those are the countries outlined in green. Um, there, Saudi Arabia, Oman, the Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, and um, Bahrain. And, um, and then the rest of West Asia, we see um, Iraq, um, Iran, and then up to Turkey, and then um, the Caucasus including Yemen. And if we look at this region, as you may know, it is very hot and dry in the central part, but in Turkey and the Caucasus, there is um, significant precipitation and highly agriculturally oriented. But as we just take a quick look at climate change by 2050, one of the uh, models for the high trajectory shows, of course, it's getting um, warmer and very warm in most of this region, but also it's getting wetter in parts of Turkey through West Asia. So we have to look at what does this mean? Is it drying or is it getting wetting? Is the increase in um, evapotranspiration taking up all of this extra rainfall? So using data from the, the GTAP, the Global Trade um, Analysis Project, and working with one of um, the CG centers, um, IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, which has a detailed global food trade model, um, and also going into that in the schematic is a climate change impact on both water availability and crops. We're able to take a look at what will happen to food trade under, in this case, one of the worst case scenarios from the AgMIP, ISIMIP um, scenarios that was produced. So what's an interesting point is as we were looking at this study, um, we pointed out is not only um, is climate a threat to food in the Gulf, but also maritime checkpoints. And, Yes, after we put out this report, sure enough, we had a problem in the Suez Canal and it was blocking um, much of the food trade going to the GCC. So very interesting, timely uh, event. So if we look at this, what's happening in the GCC, we find out that if we look at the row here in the top row, percentage of imports, and we notice from on grains um, in the GCC countries from Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, um, almost 80 to above 75% is imported. When we look at Saudi Arabia, 60% of its grain is imported and that's changing as well. In UAE, 93% of its grain 
and you can see it on the different different products where the rest of West Asia in the Caucasus and Turkey, it's very limited, but Jordan, Israel, and a number of the other countries have still this very high, what we think of as the Middle East, very high imports of that. The other thing we tend to look at is what is the number of the major importers from which countries are they coming? And we came up with this analysis, which is in red for those countries that are there, uh, which is called an import vulnerability index. And so when we talk about food self-sufficiency and food security, one of the issues here is if it's in red, there is a very high percentage of food being imported, but from a very low number. As we look here um, in, in Saudi Arabia, their rice, 95% of their rice is being imported from three countries. So it's very highly um, vulnerable to what happens in those countries um, from climate, but from other global changes. So one of the things we looked at, which was very interesting, there was a lot of food going into the UAE. And we said, um, if all that food went there and was all eaten there, it would be everyone would be way overweight. We'd have an obesity problem. But then what we see here is there's a lot of inter-GCC food trade. So UAE is becoming the trans transshipment point um, or the middle, middle person for a lot of food that's coming in. And you see it coming in and going out to other GCC regions. The same thing for Saudi Arabia, particularly in milk and meat, Saudi Arabia is exporting quite a bit of its milk and meat to the other um, regions, as well as we can see this on processed food. So as we look at this, there's all these interactions of both raw materials and others. So if we take a quick look at Saudi Arabia, um, we can take a detail, let's just look at grains. So they're bringing in 60% of their grains are being imported, but what's interesting is 30% of their grains are being used to feed um, animals for livestock. Um, and then as we look at what, what do we expect to happen to grains in Saudi Arabia, there'll be a 10% increase, decrease in yields, but the world market price in, in uh, grains are going up about 30% in 2050. So if we go to look at GCC as a whole, and on the top are the results from the IFPRI model showing the increase in food, um, food prices by 2050, there, um, there's a slight increase because of global demand, but what would climate change do? We see 30% in grains, 24% in, um, in rice and milk and meat, about 4%. What would that mean for Saudi Arabia and particularly in per capita consumption, which is then related to nutrition? And what we see is only a slight decrease. The biggest thing is in oil seeds, um, what we'd say three to 4%. So that's not a, a huge impact, um, but we see changes in imports and actually see increasing of imports in cereals in the future because of this continuing demand for milk and meat um, and the changing diet and growing population and economic growth, they're still gonna wanna import there. So if we take a look at, at cereals globally, and um, this comes right out of the, the IFPRI model, if we look at the developing world up in the top and from 2010 to 2050, what you see is net um, total global trade going from about 86 million metric tons to 224. And that's mostly going from the developed world to the developing world. So in the future, we're seeing a great demand in cereals increasing by 2050. The other thing is you look and see where this is in Africa, huge increases in Africa and Middle East, but importantly, where is it coming from? The Americas, there's almost a tripling of exports from North America um, in South America to feed the world. Now, so we, hit, we take here, this is a, um, a sense of what's happening, where in the world are cereals changing, green is impacting, um, climate change is helping, um, the red is decreasing. We take that and look at what's happening in 2050. Look at this, we see what's happening is this 224 million metric tons drops about 93. We see that dropping dramatically in Africa, which is going to lead to um, a calorie consumption issue, if we look in the, the middle two slides between 2050 with and without climate change, for sub-Saharan Africa, we see a drop from 134 to 124, as well as local um, production going down. So we're seeing this in, in the um, Americas, we see a dropping, but one of the big things is seeing a big drop in the exports from the Americas. Also, where do we see an increase we see the former Soviet Union in Europe taking up some of the slack that came from the Americas in increasing by about um, 40% in 
their exports of grain. Um, but we see this, uh, these increased costs, the, low, the, the lack of production leading to all of these issues. So what are the insights that we get from looking at that? Is that the, the global change leads to a major increase in food pay trade by 2050. So even without climate change, just economic and population growth. Do we have the infrastructure that's needed to get that food from the um, exporting countries to the importing countries? Um, are the ports being built? Are the rails, are, there, are the shipments being ready to do that? Because there's a threefold increase of that. Are we ready for it? Climate change has a potential for a major impact on the exporting countries which is gonna to lead to increased prices. This will lead to increases in world market prices. And for many parts of the world where we're now starting to focus, it will bring an increase of risk to hunger in the lower income countries that can't afford um, to pay for these higher prices. So um, I thank you for your time and we'll be happy to answer questions later. And thank you for this uh, to the organizers for, uh, for allowing us to speak today. Wow, great on time man. congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for that um, very informative presentation. Um, we'll be moving to the next presentation um, by Shela, uh, who, uh, Shela Chaudhry, who's a research associate at the Environmental Law Institute. And uh, she'll be presenting on conflict sensitive programming for water management. The floor is yours. Thank you, Asma. Uh, so as Asma said, my name is Shela Chaudhry and I'm a research associate at the Environmental Law Institute. So last year, a team at the Environmental Law Institute led by Carl Brock completed an evaluation of the Global Environment Facilities project portfolio for the purpose of assessing how these projects have been impacted by operating in areas affected by armed conflict or otherwise fragile settings. Um, the evaluation revealed a number of important findings regarding the necessity of designing and implementing projects in a manner that's calibrated for the unique needs of conflict affected areas. So today I'd like to share with you all just some of the implications of these findings specifically uh, for water programming. So to begin, I'd like to just give you all a bit of background on the Global env uh, Environment Facility, uh, often abbreviated as the GEF. So the GEF was first established ahead of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit uh, with the express mission of funding environmental protection projects around the world. Since that time, they've supported over 5,000 projects in 170 countries, um, providing more than $21.1 billion in grants and $114 billion in co-financing. So that work has really been separated into six primary focal areas, those being biodiversity, chemicals and waste, climate change, forests, international waters, and land degradation. So of course today, I'd like to zoom a little bit into the Jeff International Waters focal area specifically. So the Jeff is in fact the world's largest funding mechanism for multi-country collaboration on water and oceans projects. Um, the nature of these projects is quite diverse, but at the core, Jeff International Waters projects focus on ensuring sustainable management uh, and prevention of pollution for both marine and freshwater ecosystems. Uh, these projects aid 156 countries as well as an additional 24 non-recipient countries in managing their transboundary water resources. Um, these projects account for 11% of the Jeff's overall allocation, which amounts to 405 country, regional, and global level projects. So with that understanding of the GEF um, and the International Waters Focal Area, I would like to just dive into the findings of the evaluation of GEF support to conflict-affected and fragile situations. So first and foremost, our findings revealed that the vast majority of GEF projects are occurring in conflict-affected or fragile environments. Um, at the time of the evaluation, the GEF had invested approximately 4 billion USD uh, in countries affected by major armed conflict, which accounts for about one third of the GEF's global portfolio. Uh, aside from these areas with active conflict, 88% of all GEF country level projects were in countries considered fragile situations. And looking more specifically at international waters projects, you can see there, um, that would be 35% of the country level international waters projects uh, were conducted in countries affected by major armed conflict and 83% took place in fragile situations. So we actually found that the Jeff's water programming was more likely than its other projects uh, to occur in what we called mixed situations. So these are situations that include um, countries both in conflict status and non-conflict status. This was due in large part to the fact that the Jeff International Waters projects uh, specifically focus on transboundary water resources, 
So they pay extra attention to these international cooperation aspects of the work. Um, a large part of their focus is actually to just ensure that states sharing important resources like lakes, um, watersheds, groundwater aquifers, et cetera, are able to co-manage them sustainably and cooperate on these um, areas. So uh, these projects do more frequently involve multiple states and often these states might have histories of tension or other conflicts. So for example, the Jeff has undertaken projects to improve co-management in places like um, the South China Sea and the Mekong River. So as part of the evaluation, we did actually undertake a quantitative analysis uh, in addition to our document review. So we assessed the terminal evaluation review scores that the Jeff assigns each of its completed projects and tested for correlation between these numbers and the fragile states index scores associated with the project operating areas. Uh, what we found was that conflict and fragility had statistically significant impacts um, on the likelihood of a project being canceled or dropped, as well as on its terminal valuation ratings. So in summary, the fragility classification was associated with um, negative and statistically significant impacts on outcomes, sustainability, monitoring and evaluation design, um, monitoring and evaluation implementation, implementation quality and execution quality. So our evaluation provided us a lot of insight uh, into the different pathways by which these impacts occur. Uh, unfortunately, due to time constraints, I can't go through this in too much detail, but there are a few things I'd like to highlight. So conflict affected and fragile situations are often characterized um, by fiscal insecurities, by social conflict and mistrust, um, by complex economic situations, political fragility and weak governance. While these factors can seem like larger issues in the system um, that might feel separated from your specific project, we find that these, these larger factors do actually trickle into the project environment in a number of ways. So for example, many of the projects we looked at um, had to be dropped or canceled because the project sites just became inaccessible um, due to increasing physical insecurity or concerns about the safety of the project staff related to larger political conditions. So one example of this is actually a project we looked to um, we took a look at focused on Lake Tanganyika, uh, which is shared by Tanzania, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, and Zambia. So this is, pro this is a project that was quite severely impacted by the changing political, condi political conditions in Burundi uh, and DRC in the, 19, in the late 1990s. So the project had to decrease their planned fishing activities because there was a growing concern amongst local um, military that rebels were using fishing boats to transport raiding parties. And so just the act of putting a fishing boat on the lake uh, ended up presenting security risks to the project staff. Um, likewise, the field staff was also unable to reach certain monitoring locations due to physical insecurity um, to collect the samples they had planned. So their monitoring evaluation was kind of put off by that as well. So though the just projects are impacted by conflict in all of these ways, um, the institution does not have any standardized policies safeguards or official guidance in place uh, for implementing staff operating in these areas. Um, that said, we do see the implementing staff for these projects uh, have been incredibly innovative over time and have continued to find ways to adapt their operations to the specific needs of their working context. So we found that the project responses to conflict and fragility could generally be typologized into several categories. Uh, again, I can't go through this in too much detail given the time constraints. But one thing I would like to highlight is just that every risk management strategy we took a look at just begins with some acknowledgement um, that specific risks exist and are involved with the particular operating area. Um, while some Jeff projects, you know, don't really move on beyond that uh, acknowledgement aspect, often the more successful ones are the ones that took this acknowledgement and moved into more proactive approaches. So the categories we found uh, could be described as avoidance, uh, mitigation, peace building and learning. So I just like to emphasize some of the specific strategies um, that we found utilized in some of the international waters projects we evaluated. Um, first, it is incredibly important to be mindful of historical tensions between different stakeholder groups. Uh, take the time early in the project to become familiar with them, strategize your implementation plan around them, but also seek opportunities uh, to increase and build trust between these stakeholder groups as much as possible. Um, second, international water projects benefited from emphasizing stakeholders' mutual interests in water resources. Everyone needs clean, healthy water ecosystems, and building trust and community around this fact uh, can be really beneficial to the project's implementation. Um, third, 
project staff should seek to maintain a presence, even if it's not necessarily a physical one. Um, certainly in the COVID pandemic, we've seen that you can accomplish quite a lot uh, being remotely, and many projects were able to still achieve goals um, even when physical insecurity prevented them from reaching their project sites. So being creative in that, uh, in that aspect. And finally, what I would say is the most important lesson is to remain flexible and be ready to seek out creative solutions. And you know, while this may seem straightforward and um, you know, it means more than just being ready emotionally to do that, but also building that flexibility into the infrastructure of your project, whether that's in how you craft your budget or how you plan your implementation. Uh, it's really important to give yourself that room to adapt later on. So finally, just to finish up today, I'd like to re-emphasize just a few key points for you all. Um, first, conflict and fragility matter. Uh, they matter in how we design our projects and how we carry out our work. Operating in these contexts presents unique risks, but also unique opportunities. Um, these contexts need to be approached differently than the average project in a non-conflict setting. Project staff should assess risks early in the design phase and plan for potential complications. And institutions as much as possible should be seeking to provide guidance, policies, safeguards, and dedicated staff for these efforts. Um, so uh, it looks like my time is up, but if you'd like to find out more information about any of this, the full evaluation report is available online on the JEST website. And thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, Shah, for, the, for your presentation. Now we'll be moving to the next uh, speaker, and that's uh, Professor um, Associate Professor Gretchen Miller, um, who will be presenting on quantifying embedded water and agriculture goods for sustainable groundwater use in Mexico. Howdy, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Um, so today um, I want to talk about some work that um, my former master's student, um, Ellie Torres Padilla, has um, completed on looking at how we can um, better quantify where um, into the economic system uh, our use of water goes. And, and she's looked at, um, along with some of my collaborators here at A&M, John Nielsen Gammon and Peter Knappett, and our uh, collaborator, former of, formerly of A&M and uh, now at Yale University, Emily Sellers. So we're a cross-disciplinary group and part of this work is also related to some that uh, Peter Knappett will be presenting uh, later in the conference. Um, so this is a small slice of what we're looking at in looking at the connection between um, water sustainability and economic sustainability. Um, as, as many of you are, I'm sure, aware, Mexican aquifers are pretty heavily exploited, uh, or maybe exploited is not the right word, but pretty heavily used for agriculture. Um, and this tends to be increasing over time. Um, we looked at a data set of uh, water use for agriculture in Mexico that um, we constrained from 2007 to 2014. And you can see over time the increase in our uh, ground water volume extracted by the irrigation districts. And you can see how this is highly spatially variable. And a lot of the spatial variability, you know, we're, we're interested in the connection between the spatial variability here for groundwater use and where crops are grown and where crops are grown most efficiently, least efficiently, um, etc. Uh, we're also interested in what fraction of this water use comes from um, groundwater. So you can see the fraction of groundwater um, to the total fraction of water used for agriculture in, um, in Mexico. And this runs about 20%, but is also much like extraction is increasing over time. It is also increasing over time. Um, so depletion really, this groundwater depletion presents some serious risks to food production um, in areas where we have this high um, groundwater to surface water use ratio. Um, so if you look at this top figure, the red areas are places where groundwater use is, um, is say, uh, more than doubled um, the use of surface water. And uh, most of these groundwater um, aquifers, most of these aquifers that are, are providing for agriculture are fairly non-renewable. And so this, this suggests to us that um, there is you know, a problem brewing as these aquifers are depleted. 
Um, you can also see um, the groundwater exploitation index, and this is an index that's developed by uh, Conagua, the um, Mexican agency for uh, uh, water and water management. You can see in a lot of places where um, we have this high groundwater to surface water ratio, this high use of groundwater for food production are also the same places where we have uh, groundwater exploitation index that is high, uh, or excuse me, that is low. In this case, the red here is um, one, and these are the most exploited aquifers. And you can see a lot of overlap in those areas. So what we wanted to do here uh, was use this uh, data um, available from Conagua along with some reanalysis products from um, the um, uh, NOAA, the U.S. Agency for um, um, Atmospheric Science, essentially, uh, which has produced uh, plots of precipitation and evapotranspiration uh, using a reanalysis method. So this is essentially a modeling method combined with data, and it allows, um, they've produced monthly, monthly high resolution plots of um, precipitation and evapotranspiration again over the 2007 to 2014 period. Now, using this data, we can get an estimate of what we call either green or blue water. So green water uh, embedded in agriculture is essentially all of the precipitation that gets re-evaporated into the atmosphere and used for production versus blue water, which is like surface water. Um, so from these, these estimates from NOAA, along with um, crop uh, coefficients um, using the FAO method, we're, we're able to calculate water footprints um, based on also the area of agriculture, um, uh, the area of a specific crop um, given, found by the uh, Mexican Agricultural um, uh, Commission. And combining these two gives us a way to calculate what the, the total water use for by crop um, over a particular area um, and by source. Is it rain fed? Is it um, groundwater? Or is it surface water? So rain fed being the green, groundwater and surface water being the blue. From there, we can further take these water footprints and look at um, how much water is being used per ton of agriculture production and per uh, peso of um, economic production. Uh, so these water footprints give us an idea of water use um, for, in this case, irrigated crops as a function of time and space. And so we can see how these patterns uh, change over time based on um, things like um, the, at, at, excuse me, at the county level, so at a really high resolution. Uh, again, this is a, a similar method to um, that has been used for water footprinting at say a larger level, say national level, um, Hoekstra from the Netherlands and Konar from the University of um, Illinois have, have done this for the United States, or have done this at, at a, war, a national, international scale and at a US scale. Um, but we are looking, this is the first time we've looked at a very close scale in um, Mexico. We can see how our blue water footprint in um, overall for irrigated crops really um, strongly outpaces the green water footprint. So relatively speaking, there is a high proportion of these crops um, that are being irrigated. And a lot of this is occurring in areas where, we, where there is low rainfall, of course. Uh, breaking this up into the types of crops, oh, and I'm sorry, this is small, um, the types of crops that are uh, typically grown um, in the north, of, of Mexico, we have a uh, high irrigation um, and uh, the, the types of crops are uh, more staples. So corn grains, beans, sugarcane, uh, sorghum, things that um, typically get either consumed um, locally 
or some of which are, are exported. Um, but in the south where we have high, high rainfall, um, or in the areas with the higher rainfall where we rely on um, green water, the high green water dominated areas are producing crops that are, are, are more um, economic kind of cash crops. So limes, mangoes, oranges, mandarins, um, high water consumption, but also rain fed. We can see these really high regional differences in uh, crop production and groundwater use as well. Um, so groundwater use for irrigation, um, we see is really high in the, the northern regions, as opposed to on the left precipitation, which is high in, in the southern regions. But then um, total crop production, which is, is balanced in this, this central region. Um, we can also see that in these northern regions, there is a lot more variability in the footprints. So if we look at the blue water footprint here at the bottom, we see a spike in um, 2011. And we can tie this directly to the drought. Um, if we look at the general increase between 2009 and 2010 in the blue water footprint associated with production, um, we have, have um, some areas which are increasing slightly. In um, between 2010 and 2011, we see a sharp increase due to that drought. Um, so in summary, um, this data is available and I will put something in the Q&A later. Um, this, this data is available um, via um, Quasi HydroShare, and it is our first high resolution um, temporal and spatial uh, water footprint analysis for Mexico, as far as we've seen. Um, it reveals some spatial patterns in groundwater consumption and, and potential future hotspots for depletion, um, shows the impact of um, drought on our water use portfolio and allows us for a deeper study of a number of economic factors. And with that, I'm sorry, my time is up and I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gretchen, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to invite the participants once again to send their questions through the Q&A chat box. And we'll be moving to our next presentation by Professor Jing Bo Liu, uh, who is a professor at Texas A&M um, University, Kingsville and Texas A&M Energy Institute. And he'll be presenting on the use of natural products as green producing agents to produce effective nano disinfectant um, for wastewater remediation, remediation, sorry. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Um, well, good morning or good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting us, this is a privilege. And uh, there's uh, two co-authors for this presentation, myself, uh, Sajid Bashir and my partner, Jingbo Louise Liu. Um, she will not give the talk, I will give the talk on her behalf. Um, just a backstory uh, about something Kenneth said reminded me, um, in 2001, we actually did a project at Cornell University of the US aid to understand hunger. And what we noticed was that 45% of the food was wasted from the farm to the store. And Cornell uh, project, the genomics project Cornell was basically to look at genetic tools to slow down fruit ripening so that the fruit, the food will go from the, from the fields to the stores without going bad. Okay, one of the things we didn't realize at that time was the criticality of water, right? And my talk today or our talk today will focus on um, at, the, at the four feet level. So when you talk about policy, typically you're, you're literally talking about 30 feet, 30,000 feet higher policy, you know, that combines multiple continents and where we are, we are at the four feet level. We are actually in the trenches doing the work. So our project or our analysis will be more on how to clean water and how to get that water clean so that we can utilize it more efficiently. It's great to have the plant. It's great to uh, slow down aging, but you can't grow a plant if you don't have water. And that's the criticality of that. Okay, um, so this is just a number of areas where uh, modern materials, nanomaterials can be used. Um, and one of the things that we are learning right now is, believe it or not, the coronavirus, um, it uh, can go into water droplets. And when we inhale the water droplets, we get what's known as dry pneumonia. A lot of the people that died in 2019, 2020, early on, were people uh, that were in old uh, retirement homes. And so getting uh, clean water 
that's free of microbes and pathogens is critical. And I'm not gonna go through this entire slide, but there's a number of different um, synthesis plans, synthesis strategies to uh, implement depending on uh, the, the endpoint. So in our case, we're looking at nanomaterials that can decarbonize uh, organics from water. So when, when you think about uh, water, uh, a lot of times you have textile uh, waste going in, human obviously waste that the previous two speakers spoke about. Okay, um, you've got uh, inorganic materials. And so what you want to do is you want to use light energy to facilitate that decomposition and also kill any pathogens or any viruses. And so that water then can be suitable for growing for plant irrigation. All right, and so here's just an example um, of using nanomaterials. And so in this particular case, we're using metals and carbon nanotubes. The carbon nanotubes basically are molecular wire. It conducts electrons, okay, and our platinum is basically the catalyst that generates electrons and does all the chemistry. And what we do is we take molecular oxygen from the air and the molecular oxygen will interact and basically do some catalysis. So um, one of the things about nanomaterials um, that's different to bulk materials, for example, if you are married, you, you most likely will have a silver or gold wedding ring. Uh, this would be called bulk gold. The difference between bulk gold that you have on your finger and what you see in the slide is that we can arrange atoms that uh, are like a rod. And what you notice is that next to the atoms, there's space and those atoms are a lot more reactive than if you have bulk. So if you think of a tray of eggs, right? You notice you have a tray of eggs and you have, a, you have an outer layer of eggs. Between them, there's air, but the inner layer of eggs, they have eggs next to them. They have neighboring eggs. And what happens with such materials is that if you have a lot of atoms nearby, you, you, you're, you have neighbors that are atoms, you're not chemically reactive. So if you think, think of gold, all those gold eggs that are in the middle of the tray are not chemically reactive. So if you have 64 eggs, you literally only have about 14 or 15 eggs on the outer boundary that you can do chemistry. And all the inner ones, uh, that's your bulk gold, you cannot do chemistry. So in this example, uh, we're just showing you different topographies. Um, so if you look at A and B, that's just showing you that you have two layers and you can align those layers like this, right? Or you can you can uh, do 45 degrees and do like a, a attached layer. So one going this way. And the idea is that you can do chemistry here, you can do chemistry here, because each of these fingers um, has empty space. And so these atoms are reactive, whereas before that, the idea here is that we could do much more effective chemistries uh, with lower amounts. And so again, if you think about East Africa, Western Africa, where resources are limited, you want to maximize your catalyst. And by using a milligram loads of catalyst, you can do more chemistry and therefore purify more, uh, more water and therefore enhance the, you know, enhance your resources. Okay, I talked about pathogens. Uh, one of the things that we noticed uh, was that there was a um, SARS-16. Uh, so a lot of you may not be familiar, but uh, this uh, COVID virus, it's actually related um, uh, to uh, a family of viruses that are called COVID. It's not the first time that we've had this. We've actually had this before. The last major outbreak was 2016. And in 2016, we developed this um, molecule that you see in my lower left-hand side that looks a very complicated eight, eight pore uh, ligand. And what we found was that this uh, particular uh, material is called a metal organic framework was very, very effective in uh, stripping out those T proteins from the virus. And so when the virus gets close to these pores, you see these little pores, um, these cobalt atoms, they can interact with the T protein and basically uh, make the T protein more fluid. And when you make it more fluid, you'll see this in the upper right hand corner. This is E. coli, the called food, food poisoning in Germany. And you can see we're literally melting it from the inside out. So we're increasing the, the plasticity of the membrane. And so you imagine a piece of plastic and you're bending it, you're bending it, you're gonna see a little strain, you keep bending it and you notice that you could stretch it and it breaks. That's what we're doing at the molecular level. And so the advantage of this approach is that many microbes that we have in our bodies or in water are unfortunately resistant to antibiotics. So if you um, take light or, or chlorine, right, um, you need very high concentration. And so when we go swimming, you know, we smell the chlorine or water, we don't like that because you need a very high concentration to kill that. And that causes secondary byproducts that can cause human disease, particularly respiratory disease. And in the time of COVID, the last thing you want is a respiratory disease. These are uh, nanomaterials they are always active and we're using them in parts per million, very, very small, very, very small amounts, one milligram per liter typically. 
And you notice here on the right-hand side, we've uh, tested them with standard uh, disinfection uh, protocols that you use to disinfect water. Uh, we break them down into three different classes. Um, the early class, which was the silver base, which is from the 1970s. And then you think about bleach, which is you know from the 40s onwards. And then you think about our material. And the idea is to lower the lower this column, the more effective your material. And you can see how our E. coli that can cause disease um, uh, is basically uh, dis uh, basically neutralized, inactivated within 30 minutes. Um, and so when you guys um, are sick, you do an MRI. And typically what the MRI does is scans your body and looks at hydrogen and carbon. And based on that, the clinician can uh, think about the progression of a disease. We can do something similar with microbes and other organics and that's called eels. We, the technique is unimportant. What is important is that we can look for particular elements that give us an indicator of what is going on. So for example, our nerve cells, to, for me to do this, I need to have my neurons pump calcium and potassium and sodium. So sodium and potassium go one way and calcium goes the other way. And that sets up an electrical field and the electrical field stimulates my muscles to do that. The, the microbes, they actually have something similar. They don't have nerve cells, but they have something similar called cellular communication, and they have to pump sodium potassium in. And so if you look at this top line, you'll see that this top line, um, it's pretty uh, white. It's lit up. It's got potassium. And so when we add these nanomaterials, what happens is we short circuit that system. We short circuit that potassium cannot, cannot be stored. You cannot store potassium. It leaks out, leaks out. And then your chemical uh, system, your electrical field cannot be uh, maintained. You switch up the electrical field, the membrane becomes more plastic, and the microbe uh, basically dissolves. And the example here is two different types of microbes that are common in water. Escherichia coli, which is a tough one, looks like a rod, and um, Staphylococcus aureus that looks like grapes, a bunch of grapes. They're very common, cause a lot of uh, disease. And you can see in both of these that by using titanium uh, silver oxides, uh, we can switch up that field and because we can switch it off, the microbe then becomes inactive, regardless of the fact that it's immune to certain antibiotics, because ours is an is a electrochemical method rather than an antibacterial method. And therefore, we can inactivate microbes that ordinarily will be immune. So this is more of the mechanism. We don't need to concern ourselves with this mechanism. The, the point here is that we can tune um, our nanomaterials uh, to affect certain biological processes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, we'll be moving to our last presentation uh, by Karen Vilholt, a principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute. And she'll be presenting on One Water, One Health, One Earth, the triple O concept for sustainable Anthropocene. The floor is yours, Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm pleased to be in, in, the, in the conference. Um, have you been able to? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so this is not my final version, but that's fine. I can I can carry on like this. Um, so I'll be talking about this uh, work that we have been engaged in um, over the last half year or so. It's fairly recent, and uh, this is uh, my first presentation around the topic. Um, this is a topic that is not really related to research as, as sort of in a traditional sense, but it's more the way that we can uh, use research in sort of uh, mobilizing action uh, that addresses uh, uh, global issues around health, water insecurity, and, um, and, 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 and hunger, basically. Um, and also with my background, I have focused somewhat on the groundwater aspects because it's very critical, as uh, we already heard in the previous presentation uh, on Mexico, how these um, different areas are highly uh, overexploited in terms of groundwater. Um, the impetus for this uh, basically stems from the COVID-19. Um, I think it's very clear from um, for many of the presentations also that COVID has sort of spurred a sense of connectedness or joint responsibility across the globe uh, around our resources and what we are doing uh, to our food systems basically um, and, and how we have to deal with that and not only in a piecemeal manner but at a global scale because uh, there is this interconnectedness 
between uh, different parts of the world. Um, uh, and, and I'll talk more about some of these different um, uh, teleconnections, as I like to call them. Uh, um, on top of the COVID-19, I think um, we also realize, uh, or I, I should mention that this was based on work that um, I presented as part of Earth Day on the 22nd of April uh, with exactly this topic, um, addressing how we can uh, address uh, groundwater depletion basically through uh, more action and, and, and uh, global um, interconnected um, partnerships and so on. Um, so in my paper, I basically just point to the fact that um, we have to consider uh, the water resources on the globe as, as one uh, confined and constrained resource. Um, and uh, this is recycled uh, naturally, but also through other means. But this is basically the resource that we have available to us. And because of that, um, we have to be very careful. I think for us as uh, researchers, this is a, a very obvious fact that we don't really need to think about. But when we talk about the public and so on, it's very critical to get these messages across. And so I, I, I would like to point that out. And also on the next slide, you can see also the connection that um, we have with groundwater and uh, also highlighting that because it's kind of um, under the radar uh, and, and uh, unnoticed by most people uh, when we talk about uh, uh, interactions with food and climate and health and so on. So really pr pressing that uh, agenda forward as well and understanding groundwater as being part of this uh, one water concept and we need to um, ad address and manage uh, this resource along with other resources. And this next one is sort of just spilling down to the local level where we also understand that these interactions are, are very crucial. Um, and um, the point of this uh, concept then uh, drills into uh, sort of the, the, the context of the aquifers. And uh, we have to realize about 20% of the world's uh, aquifers are being overexploited. And many of them are feeding global populations basically. And also um, we have a lot of um, footprints, if you like, uh, and, and you can spell that with a D as footprints um, that are linked to our global um, uh, consumption of, of food. And a lot of that is linked to groundwater depletion, um, but it's not really recognized. And so there's a need to also bring that linkage to the food to the forefront. And if you look a little more at the, at the, at the facts, um, a lot of the production from groundwater is actually feeding uh, uh, these larger uh, crops that are being shifted around the world, like uh, maize and wheat and rice and sugarcane and so on, that are very uh, water intensive. And you can also, in a way, um, say that these um, some of the crops are maybe not optimal in terms of human health. And so a, there's a need to reconsider that. And I think there's a growing acknowledgement uh, that we need to bring those uh, nutritional and dietary aspects into our uh, global food uh, transformation, if you like, um, and getting people more aware of these things. Um, if you look at uh, sort of the link between the, the global footprints, if you like, and also the, 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 the energy intake and, and these teleconnections that I mentioned before, it is quite clear that uh, where we have most uh, dietary intake and where quite a lot of uh, food imports are happening uh, in, in the part of the world where we are well off. And, and so we need to consider how we can equilibrate uh, some of those um, some of those food flows and energy and, 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 and trade flows uh, so that uh, by our food consumption, our uh, food intake and, and, and so on can actually have an impact on other parts of the world. So this links a lot to um, previous discussions about virtual water flows and so on. But, but this concept is not necessarily about trade and how we equilibrate water trade um, or water uh, through trade. But, but more so linked to our uh, food consumption and how we can uh, manipulate uh, some of those streams through our uh, uh, food uh, consumption patterns in, in different parts of the world. And here we're not necessarily only talking about the developing countries, but also very much about the developing, the developed countries. <clears throat> 
I wanted to then briefly talk about sort of some of the ways forward um, and wanted to address some of the issues that uh, or some of the initiatives that are already out there. And I think we need to really um, think of what are the possible solutions or possible ways forward. Um, I think one thing that really springs to, to mind here is that youth is coming forward. Uh, young people are sort of uh, showing a lot of passion around food. They want to make a difference and they can see that food makes a, a, a huge impact. Um, we've seen Greta Thunberg now coming on the stage and also addressing uh, impacts on our food uh, consumption and linking that to her climate change uh, action agenda. And uh, we also have FAO coming in with the uh, World Food Forum and also with the um, uh, um, youth uh, forum that, uh, that they're leading. And I think we can, we can take some offspring in that and, uh, and bring uh, some of the knowledge that we as uh, researchers have into the picture and, and really sort of highlight some of these connections and also the connections to groundwater that I mentioned before that are really silent in many of these discussions. Um, and, and so in, in the, to, just to wrap up, uh, I wanted to just sort of uh, connect some of these dots, if you like. So, uh, so wrapping up, I think there's a lot of uh, interest from youth in terms of having a say and having impact in the world in terms of uh, sort of correcting some of the, the past uh, uh, poor pathways that we have taken so far. Um, and um, there's been a lot of interest in the climate uh, agenda, but I think now the food agenda is, is increasingly also being uh, embraced. And I think that's where we can come in and, and support with our knowledge as researchers and um, with our connections and partnerships and, and some, somehow get some synergy from, from interacting with young people. Another dot I think that we uh, should really um, bring forward is the social media and various innovations that are out there in terms of technologies and communication means and uh, visualizations and so on, so that we can really bring groundwater and, and water more broadly uh, forward. We know that next year, uh, 22 is the year of groundwater. And so I think this is the time where we can step up on these aspects and bring these dots together. And um, I'm not sure what I have on my slide, but you can uh, possibly, yeah. So this is sort of my last slide and you can just go to the last final one. And um, this is just our uh, network of uh, groundwater uh, partners that are looking at these aspects. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Karen. And thank you for keeping that time. Uh, now we have our Q&A uh, session. We have a uh, little bit, uh, yes, we have about 10 minutes. Um, so far we had questions in the box that were answered and written by the panelists, but I invite the, the participants to check these questions in the Q&A and to, uh, into, to put more questions in the, um, in the box. Uh, so far we have, um, uh, let's say not exactly a question, but a, a query by uh, Karl Brusch, who is asking anyone who has experience of good or otherwise uh, in conflict sensitive water programming. So perhaps one, if our one of our panelists, one or more of our panelists has such an experience, perhaps you can tell us a few words and also the participants, if you have an answer to a testimony to give to Karl, please don't hesitate to uh, answer in the uh, Q&A box. So would uh, anyone from our uh, panelists uh, like to give an example or is aware of an example or can say something to Carl? I'll, I'll add something um, to the conversation. Um, there, so the, there's, there's both sides of the discussion where conflict is happening where we're trying to do water and that has brought um, struggles to the completion or even the conception of that problem. And then also the, the other side of the problem where the water development itself is leading to conflict. And I think uh, the perfect example right now is we are looking at um, uh, the, uh, the Blue Nile and the, um, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and what that is causing now in terms of conflict in, in the region. So there's some interesting um, arrows go both ways. 
And a lot of the region, reason for the, the project of the GERD is the World Bank and others were work, working for a long time to develop a um, sustainable cascade of reservoirs on the Blue Nile in Ethiopia. And in regionally, it was not being moving forward. So Ethiopia unilaterally did that. So conflict and other issues in the region then accelerated that. And there are other examples in a lot of the other major transboundary uh, conditions that we're seeing um, also between India and, and Pakistan over the upper Indus um, and a number of other issues as we look at these transboundary conditions and they seem to be hotspots now with Kashmir and those things. So there's, there's a lot of ones that we can look at um, in, in that area. Okay, thank you, Kenneth. Someone else has something to add? Just to jump in on this. So Carl Bruck, uh, the one who asked that question is actually the lead um, on the project that I had discussed. So certainly if anyone, either the panelists or attendees has any experiences they'd like to share, we would be super interested to hear more. Um, and so please feel free to reach out, you know, whether in the Q&A box or if you'd like to email me or Carl, um, uh, you can find him at bruck, B-R-U-C-H at ELI.org or myself uh, at C-H-O-W-D-H-U-R-Y at ELI.org. Okay, thank you, Phil. I also like to uh, inform the participants that Carl has added the reference to the report you mentioned. And uh, there was a question about the river, Jordan River Basin, and a project, which is a place of uh, ongoing uh, conflict. And uh, just to highlight uh, Carl's answer about uh, the projects that uh, Jeff has uh, funded in this uh, basin, which were not really related to the conflict itself, of course, but more to biodiversity. Um, I don't see more questions in the uh, chat, uh, in the Q&A, sorry. Um, um, being the oldest panelist, I will um, say a little something, uh, trying to wrap them all together. I think there, there is a common theme going on here, is that as we look to um, global change, as I like to look at it, which one element is climate, um, one of the things that's becoming more and more clear is that the issues of hunger and poverty, um, and particularly food security, are becoming more acute in, in many regions of the world, and climate is making that even worse. And the, and the, and the work that the panelists are, are doing that we saw here, that conflict makes it even worse, and that these issues of overexploitation of the groundwater resources, and then how do we do that? Those are nice, groundwater is a nice short fix, but how do we get long-term views at that? And then we have to take it within the economic context and then the issue of political and conflict leads to this issue of food sustain food self-sufficiency versus food security. You know, trade is a good way that we can use that, but trade is used as a weapon. And then with food trade, it's hard to get to the urban poor and even the rural poor with that. So how do we work on things like in Mexico, making the, um, the, these areas and these remote areas much more sustainable? So I, th I think these issues that we're addressing for this entire uh, conference are all coming together and, and what we're hearing, which is so great, is seeing the multiple authors on the papers as well. So it, it was a pleasure to be part of this activity. And if our goal is you know, development, reduction of hunger, reduction of poverty, I think we even have, some people think that's been solved. I think it's the problems are even greater and we need to work together on that. Uh, yes, so thank you, Kenneth. I agree with you that the problems are getting greater, actually. We have tools to solve them, but uh, they are getting uh, uh, greater. I don't want to sound pessimistic, and we have still uh, two uh, more sessions to address this uh, subtopic about uh, managing water for food and public health in a changing world, so tomorrow and uh, Wednesday. And of course, uh, I invite uh, all of you to attend uh, the other sessions of the um, conference. Uh, now I would like to close the session. I would like really to thank our keynote and uh, all the panelists. And I thank you all for really keeping your time. We didn't have to uh, say um, your time is over. Is you, you must uh, rush up, etc. And I would like also to thank the uh, participants for staying with us and uh, and uh, putting in the Q and A box some uh, interesting uh, questions.
with all this, I would like to thank everyone and uh, say goodbye, good evening, and uh, have a nice day, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.